Howdy hackers and welcome to the first episode of Fairlight TV. What did you like the uh, intro we just had? Okay, so you have seen a lot of our videos posted here on YouTube on our channel uh, or on Facebook, however you reach them. Uh, so far, they've only been uh, videos from our products, so the computer program running and us capturing the output. Now we're actually trying to talk about our products, so you will see us in the flesh. Uh, the reason we decided to make this particular episode is that we just released Alternate Reality the Dungeon. When I'm recording this, uh, we haven't just released it yet, but it's looking really, really promising to be done in the next few days and should be done when you see this. So Alternate Reality is a C64 game, a truly complex C64 game. And there are a number of things you can talk about in relation to this game. So me having cracked it, I wanted to talk to Jason Compton, who is the world leading expert on these particular games, uh, Alternate Reality of the City and also the Dungeon. The City was released a year ago and now we're also releasing the Dungeon. Jason would probably be humble enough to say that he knows a bit, one or two things about the game, but that's quite not true. He is absolutely the world leading expert on this particular game. So let's conclude this initial part and let's talk to Jason. So hello everybody. And now we're into the Zoom with Jason Compton. Um, I'm Pontus. You would probably know me as Bacchus of Fairlight. Uh, Jason, this is actually the first time we talked. We were introduced in April 2019 by a common friend, John Hammerby, whom I also know as CRT. So we have exchanged a number of chat messages, but this is the first time we talk. So very, very nice actually seeing you in the flesh. Nice seeing you as well. So, uh, Jason, uh, as I already introduced in the intro, we are here to talk about alternate reality, the dungeon. And I actually have a live copy of the <laughs> game here, and it's now glaring a bit, but that's it. Uh, and you are invited here as the world's leading expert on the game. <laughs> I don't know, one of the biggest enthusiasts. There, there are bigger experts out there, but, uh, you know, in that I, I convinced you to take on both of the projects, I'll, I'll take some credit. Yeah, so we already worked together on the city, uh, and now we're also working on the dungeon. And the reason for the video, as I think I already mentioned in the intro here, is that we are releasing this game very, very soon after a, a very, very long and cumbersome piece of work. <laughs> Uh, but when everybody sees this, that means that we actually concluded releasing it as well. Mm -hmm. So Jason, talk about uh, yourself and, and your relation with the game. How does this start? Why the obsession over this particular game? Well, uh, both of the alternate reality games I, I played, uh, you know, when they were new-ish uh, in the 80s. I, I don't remember exactly when I got the dungeon. I don't think it was immediately after it came out. It was a, a Christmas present, so I definitely remember spending an awful lot of time on December 25th and beyond uh, playing that, that game. And the dungeon was so great because it delivered on a lot of what the city promised to do but never did. The city created this interesting world where you could imagine there were a lot of things going on, but it didn't really deliver on most of them. You know, if you went into a place that sounded like it might be interesting, like the casino or the palace or something like that, it would just tell you, oh, it's closed, you can't go here, or you need another disc, you can't do this. Uh, the dungeon has the, uh, the same or, or arguably better uh, you know, first person 3D maze view, which was very cutting edge, even, uh, even at the time the dungeon came out, but it also had a lot of variety in what you could do when you weren't just walking around the maze. There were, uh, there were different types of stores that meant different things that you could do different things at. They weren't just repainted versions of the same smithy that had basically the same items or the same kind of tavern. Uh, there, were, there were puzzles, there were riddles, and, and we'll get into more of this, but it was, uh, it was one of the first uh, really fully realized you know, single player first person RPGs on an 8-bit platform, specifically the, the Commodore 64 for yeah. what, what you and I care about, yeah. that delivered on being, 
being a really full and satisfying experience. So that that's why the dungeon uh, you know, has hung around in, in my affection for so long. Well, having dug it very much into the technical details of the game, I'm absolutely stunned and amazed by every part of it. The code is good. I've seen a lot of crappy code from, from gamers or game producers, but this is good yeah. all, all through, all through. So, but what caught your long-term interest? Was this the, the fact that it had a deeper meaning or, or a higher purpose or a quest to it? Well, the, those things too. And something that's important to know about the alternate reality games is that there, there was a promised uh, big series of them. It was supposed to be seven full games and you know, they only got through two. But there was a, a fan base that developed around the games fairly early on. You know, it's one of the first internet fandoms I became uh, aware of and involved in in the mid 1990s. And it was even, uh, it, was a, it was ahead of its time and it never went anywhere. But you know, you see, even today, you'll see developers from the 80s that are kickstarting, you know, projects to revive a game or, or do a sequel to a game. Philip Price, the original creator of Alternate Reality of uh, the City, he actually didn't have much to do with the dungeon. In the, I want to say, you know, late 90s, 1997, he was out there and, and what today would have been probably a well-organized Kickstarter campaign. In his case, it didn't really go anywhere, but he was out there, you know, only only 10, 12 years after these games first came out saying, no, we're going to, we're going to bring this back. We're going to do an MMO version. We're going to mm. continue the story. So it's not just that the, the two games got dropped off and then nothing ever happened with them again. It was an active fan base. There was some promise that the series might get revived and continued. Mm. So there's been, a, and uh, you know, a lot of, of digging has gone on uh, before uh, we got to the project. There's a lot of work that's gone on. Uh, especially from the Atari 8-bit guys to to disassemble the game, tear it apart, you know, yep. uh, ex explain the maps and the inventory system and so forth. Uh, so there's been a lot that if you want to dig into dig into the code or dig into the world, there's been a lot to look at. Well, to be honest, the, the if you scan the net, the, the reverse engineering parts or efforts are predominantly Atari based, actually. Yeah. Most of it are is quite similar. So I mean, if you look at how they try to find the definition of weapons and, and where to store stuff in memory. It looks pretty much the same, but the offset could be di a slightly different. So it starts at a different address, but then then the actual content is the same, depend regardless of which platform it, it's actually on. So uh, if you compare the city with, with the dungeons, what, what would you say are the main differences? I mean, the dungeon is more modern. It's, you know, like I was saying before, it, it delivers on basically everything it promises. You know, there aren't, uh, the city is full of places that you go in and literally nothing will ever happen. The mm. casino will never be open. You will never be able to go to the house of mill repute. You will never be able to go to the wilderness. Uh, the dungeon, there may be things that don't happen the way you'd expect because you didn't have the right item or you didn't have the, you know, you didn't do it at the right time but you can do basically everything uh, in the game. It's, it's, it's full that way. Well, uh, the, the city, the, the flip side of that was the city always had this very open-ended, once you know you can't win, you can play it like a roguelike, you can challenge yourself to just go and see how, how good of a character you can build up before they meet some you know, horrible, horrible, horrible death. Yeah. Uh, so the dungeon, you know, if you if you stop making progress in the dungeon's quest, you might get frustrated, which is what happened to to young Jason, you know, in the in the late '80s, early '90s. But um, it's it, it, there's there's just so much more to, to 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 dig into and advance the story, not just the story in your own head. Well, I mean, for me, the the dungeon is sort of it's a real game with a storyline and and an overarching quest that you can complete and all of that whereas the dungeon uh, the, the city you just go around and bash and build the character and it it can also be sort of a portal to the other worlds because there are exits to the yeah. other worlds also from that but it becomes quite repetitive after you've done it for a few hours whereas the dungeon it has additional depth to it that, that would be my summary of it so uh, we have identified two versions of the dungeon. One, because there is an opening screen and it says 1.1 or 2.1 in the lower right. 
Are you aware yeah, of any differences or? I, and I, I think that the people that prepared the fact, I did review the materials out there and I couldn't find specific things. Uh, the old alternate reality mailing list, which there are still archives of, uh, the, the dungeon developers in particular were very active. Philip Price, the original developer, uh, would, would post some to and correspond. I think that the, the dungeon developers did talk through a little bit, even if they didn't identify between the versions, they said, yeah, we, we fixed this, we noticed this. Hmm. And it is, it's interesting because, you know, we take for granted that basically every piece of software you use anywhere, yeah. you'll, you'll find a build ID somewhere. It's usually very long and, yeah. <laughs> and incremental. Um, but the dungeon was unusual. There were not a lot of games in the eighties that would openly tell you, you know, hmm. this is this revision. There, there are a few cases, but uh, so it's, it's interesting. And we, and we do have, uh, we do have clean, uh, preserved copies of, of both 1.1 and, and 2.1 uh, and 2.1, which which is nice. We we don't always have that in the 64 scene. Uh, and I you guess worked this with, is also you worked the with place where we ask anybody with some other version to please tell so, please yeah. comment or, or let us know because we are most interested in finding, especially if there is one newer than the 2.1. I would and, doubt it, but if there is, we would really really want to see it. Yeah, and, and I know we're mostly talking about the dungeon today, but the I, I want to put this plea out about the city. Um, the city definitely has different versions, but the version numbers are not displayed on the screen. And we're still looking for a very, you know, I won't get into the full details now, but there's a very particular build of it that only exists as a bad crack, where the menus are different, the, the font is different. And I, I remembered this being a, a characteristic of a game from you know, way back in like 86, 87. Uh, so there are, those, there are those things floating out around there. Um, I think it was the, the, the Apple II Cracker uh, 4 a.m. Uh, put out a tweet a couple of days ago and said, image everything. You, you literally have no idea whether what you have has been imaged before unless you do it. And he showed like six different seemingly identical originals and he's like every single one of these discs is encoded different every single one of them has some you know whether it's in the protection scheme or in the in the code itself every single one was different so like, just please image everything yeah i i strongly um emphasize the need of that so you would have full support of that statement from me so uh yeah and and also one of the differences here would be sort of the combats could you elaborate a bit on the, the differences between the combat of the city and dungeon here? Yeah, both of the games, if you, if you take a step back, both of the games have similar concepts in combat where you're ultimately picking one of a few different types of attacks or the, uh, the ability to trick or charm uh, a monster and, and kill it using your uh, a high int stat or, or high uh, charisma stat, depending. Um, but the, the way the menus were presented was a little bit different in the city. It's a very, uh, it's a, it's more cumbersome menu. It's, it's letter driven. The dungeon streamlined that it's just, it's pick a number. Um, but it, there's this concept of, you know, aggressive attack versus normal attack versus, uh, defensive, uh, posture. Um, but what the dungeon offers above and beyond that. The city had the, the concept of certain types of weapons and damage would be effective against certain types of, of monsters. If you ran into the brown mold in the middle of the night, you were probably gonna die because you would get this terrible disease from it. It was very hard to, to damage it. Even if you, you did have an item that would damage it, it was gonna hit you with spores and, and on and on. Um, the dungeon, has a much more sophisticated and uh, extensive inventory system. So what that let them do was let you carry around more weapons that could do different types of damage, you know, cold damage versus uh, a fire creature and, and mm. things like that, uh, that you could, you could switch between rather than, well, you can kind of carry four items and then after that, you immediately have to drop it, which is the way the, the city worked. All right. So they, they yeah. streamlined it, but also uh, added the notion where you can, where you're facing multiple uh, opponents in a in a combat. That wasn't uh, that wasn't the case in the city. In the city, you always fought one monster. The dungeon uh, has a, a little bit more. It, it doesn't go full uh, bard's tale. You know, ninety nine skeletons, ninety nine skeletons, ninety nine skeletons, and ninety nine skeletons. But there's there's some uh, concept of a of a bigger fight. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you, I, I think I've, I've encountered like seven at the most, or, or bats, swarms of bats. And um, I, I should also say on the technical level that every weapon and every part of the equipment you can have would be differently efficient against what you say, warm, cold, uh, good, evil, um, and all of that. I think there are like six or seven parameters that it evaluates how efficient it is as a defense or as, as an offense. So which is, yeah, it's, 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 a gump, it's a game squeezed into three disc side. So, I mean, it, it would be oh. terabytes of today's value if squeezed into those few bytes. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. So should we move on to uh, the crack possibly here? Sure, uh, and this is this is the question for you. You know, when when we first started working together, my pitch was alternate reality: of the city there is no good crack at all. Please do this, and, and you know, so now now we have one, and, and thank you again for that. Uh, and you, I because I, I I was careful. I was like, man, I don't know if he's even going to want to talk to me again. I think you were the one who first brought up, like, what about the dungeon? Should we move on to the dungeon? And I said, yeah. well. There is a stable crack out there, uh, and there was a, a variant that somebody had done with that to make it uh, REU resident. It was you know, just a vice snapshot. Uh, mm -hmm. So the, the question for you is, why did you want to move on to the dungeon, given that there was a stable, uh, you know, a stable scene version out there? Well, I mean, this is like starting a company. If you had any idea how difficult it would be, you would say no immediately, absolutely <laughs> immediately. <laughs> Twelve months later, it would seem dumb to take on the challenge. Well, <laughs> but first of all, I thought that having done uh, the city, the dungeon would be the same. So it would be just basically repeating the same process and it will take a number of weeks uh, a little bit more work but then yeah it wouldn't be that much extra work that proved to be quite wrong <laughs> wow first of all i mean the entire saving system is different Th to be honest the the actual loading system is actually more simplified uh, but here the given the tools you have access to today where you can freeze, put freeze points in the disk drive and, and you can, uh, where you can set breakpoints wherever you want in the memory, given criteria and all of that. So it feels like cheating, but a lot of that is so much easier. And, and I can do a little patch on source level and I can build a new version within 10 seconds. So uh, this would have taken eons if I didn't have a PC to do this on. So uh, and, and, and I, a big part I, of the reason, a big part of the reason for those differences, just to point out for the audience, is that the original author, like I mentioned, Philip Price, yeah. he had started to work on a variant of the dungeon, but he had a big fight with the publisher, and they ended up uh, just saying, "Well, fine, forget it. We'll have this other team do it." So. So the dungeon is, and the the the, the FAC and the mailing list uh, explain this in more detail from the, the developers themselves. But basically, they were starting from scratch with their own. Okay, here's how yeah. here's how we would do this. Here's how we would you know accomplish what what the alternate reality world is of the the 3D maze, the combat system. Yeah. Uh, so other than the fact that both of the games uh, were originally developed on the Atari 8 bit there's not that much uh, in common between them. So it's not just that one came out later, it's, it's a different mindset uh, you know, behind the code. If, if you brought up cracking games, uh, here in Europe, we had lots of tape games and, and in the US, you had more, more, the, uh, more disc games and tape games tend to have like a standard loader. So you can easily rip it out and replace it with your own. But here it's more, interwoven into the actual game it's the complexity of how it loads is a lot more complex than it can be on tape because you need to load chunks you can't like load a character you can't have an encounter that is loaded from tape it would take weeks to just pass the first bend in the in the dungeon so, so, uh, so but so I, I like to highlight the fact that it was actually easier to crack it um, and um, so that was very, very, uh, a very, very slim part of the actual challenge. The, the challenge here was 
uh, replacing the save game engine. Uh, that was a lot easier in the previous game because it was uh, you you have continuous saving. Uh, we will get into the uh, the notion or the the idea of lost, but uh, yeah. but save games has been a, a super mess, uh, and making that very very compact as well, and and throwing out their save engine and building one from scratch that looks and feels absolutely the same. But rather than their saving to a full disk, I'm saving on the same disk. So the actual save games could be on any disk. Uh, but we will get into that when we, when we see the actual directory of the disk here. And also the trainers. Um, <laughs> we spent lots and lots of, of, of time doing the trainers here. And uh, I think that the trainers are like, what would that be? Like 5K <laughs> of memory? <laughs> It's what if they're all, if they're all I, I was super happy that it, it the game doesn't use anything under kernel. So I have basically from E45 E500 up to the end of memory. So I did have plenty of memory so I could go a bit wild on the trainers and and I guess you can see that when you look at the version. Yeah. And so that, you know, that part of the answer to the question of why why go ahead when there wasn't the version out there is that yours Reduces the number of disk sizes, okay. disk sides, uh, standardizes the file systems, uh, doesn't require the specially formatted uh, save disk for characters, has the wide variety of trainers, and, and this time around they're even uh, user selectable. Absolutely so, so it's it's not just you didn't just re, you know redo the prior art you, you added. No, I mean uh, the city didn't have a version, so they're right. doing the first version was was the driving force in general. Here there was a fully legit version without the time bomb or anything. And, and JJ the breaker that did it for UCF, hat off. That's an amazing piece of work. From the, from the tool he had available at the time, I'm absolutely stunned and amazed. That guy is something else. Even Mr. Z, or uh, you would call him Mr. Z, I guess, but... Uh, he tried it and eventually said that, nah, it's too much work. I will put it aside and do something else and never really return to it. Yeah. Uh, I had lunch with Sultan a few times and we talked and, and I promised him I wouldn't spoil it for him in case he re wants to revert to it someday. <laughs> Um, and uh, but but this one is a, is a pure file version, and and if you're going to make a release which sort of counts in the competition of releases of today's standard, you must have it file based. You cannot have it disk based. So, JJ the breaker did it according to the standards at the time, but I I didn't have the luxury of of doing full disk things. Right. Loading would have been so much easier if I didn't have to adopt to the normal file system. Do you want to talk a little bit about the the loading at this point? You're you're always, you're under constant pressure to make uh, the uh, fifteen eighty one and SD two IEC versions uh, work correctly. We were just talking about this, so yes, uh, they do work it? now. So please try them. <laughs> I spend the night, so it should work <laughs> perfectly now. So, oh, Jason, Jason has been putting additional requirements in for us, and uh, so he wants NTSC, never the well, same color. So yeah, we adopted the city to that. So the intro works perfectly with that. And we ensure that it worked perfectly. And then you also I mean, these, want these to- These are NTSC games originally. Let's not- Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So hold and on a also second. SD2 IEC, that's, uh, that's a device I don't even have. So, and, uh, and if I talk to the developers of Vice, the emulator, they are so hostile. Whenever I mention it, they go bonkers. So <laughs> we, we need to tweak the settings to ensure that it sort of works the same way. Uh, but, but again, I can't test it. So I need to have you guys test it on real hardware to ensure that it actually works. And of course, you wanted to do something really weird. You wanted to do SDIAC from device 10. And of course, there was this little twitch that I missed. So it should now work with basically any device number and, and with any, I mean like eight to 11 or something. And it should work on 1541, 1581 and 71. And it should also work reverting back to standard DOS. 
So it should basically load on any device. I'm not saying it will load from any device, but any device we had any sort of opportunity of testing it on, it works. It might be slow uh, using standard kernel load, but it should at least work. No, I, I thought the, the SDGIC build that you were working with yesterday, well, once once we found the, the bug, um, yeah. it was working really nicely. And, and uh, I know you would like to ask about uh, what about the uh, RAM expansion unit version and, well, and all of that. Um, yeah, the, it, it might be possible because the loader itself has two loading modes. One is using a normal like index and converting that to loading from, uh, from some other device like, uh, like an IFFL file. That should be absolutely doable. The encounters, they were split into this big matrix. So it was a matrix on the disk that had a 16-bit pointer. And it fetched, rather than fetching files that are in sectors, it fetched them directly like this segment of this big block. Mm -hmm. And you had one segment for the character definitions and one for the graphics. And then they could make any sort of combination. So you can have this character with this graphics and, and vice versa. Uh, so they, they have made a, a, a truly efficient system for combining characters up. Uh, and I didn't have the luxury because that would be 70 plus files for the, for the characters and then 70 files plus for the um, uh, for the graphics, and that would be more than the 140 car 40 files you can have on a disk. So I needed to merge them, so make them like unique. So, do you want to show the directory and show them what you came up with? Yes, uh, let's do screen sharing. So what you will see here is the uh, is Vice. So if you think this is jerky, I'm sure we can blame the recording any anyway anyhow. But uh, so. And we hear the we hear the the simulated spinning. So this is the this is the fifteen forty one version. This is D sixty four side one, right? Yes, yes. Well, the the, the backside is absolutely jam packed. There is a, there is like one block free, and here you want as much as possible on the same disk sites because that means that you won't have to do any disk swapping. So what you see here on the first side is everything that loads before the game starts. And then there are a few of the rooms, I think like the chapel or the fountain that you need to flip over and load from this side. But uh, the 1581 version, we can just throw everything on one disk side and we're good. Nice. <laughs> so what you see here uh, in the lower part is uh, those are the character files. So here we would have three files saved and then there is this char zero, which is the index file. So, and this is the time where I would like to talk about uh, the concept of lost. Or should okay. we wait until we, uh, no, we wait until we see the, uh, the, um, the character menu character inside screen. the game. So we load. All right. And I have the opportunity here of pressing uh, Alt W and I can fast forward here. We don't want to see the deep crunching. This is uh, the, the scroller. I won't, let's, let's do it like this. So uh, this is the standard Fairlight intro, of course, but we have adopted it or adapted it a bit like we did with the city. So this is uh, a spaceship that you are about to see in, an, in its original context. Yeah. Oh, it says cracked on the 19th. I hope that's still true. <laughs> Four trainer options. Yes, so uh, we have split the trainers into different segments and because uh, several of the in-game trainers would show uh, a screen and there were simply too many screens. So it, it, it's just boring to press space through them. Yeah, in the city, it, basically everything was from a master trainer menu, but there was just so much more, like I said, there's, there's so much more you can, you can do. Uh, you know, you, we could have... It, just for the teleport trainer, you could have gone nuts. You could have had every unique uh, destination be yeah. in there. But then, the, then that trainer would have been even more pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I it's think it's, it's a nice feature to, to let people uh, uh, opt in uh, to just some of the trainers this time. Fair like travel service. Right. Okay, so here, the first one is pressing W for winning fights. It basically sets the number of opponents to one. 
Uh, so if you meet multiple of them, you don't need to kick all of their bots. You can you can just say that I will only like to fight one, and then it sets the energy to zero. So, but it, you still need to have sort of it's it's a bit turn based the, the fights, right? So at the end of your turn, it evaluates the damage you have done, and if the uh, if the character is then or the opponent is then down to zero, then you win the fight. Um, so it's not like pressing W and you, you're done. There, there will be additional... Have to survive that round, yeah. yeah. Right. And X, so inside most of the, the dungeon, it's pitch black. You start in a well, it's a well-lighted area. Um, I would say well-lit area, but uh, yeah, so it, you have the light on in the very beginning, but if you go in uh, outside of this first portion of the of the dungeon, you need something that gives you light. So yeah. X here is our version of a master switch, turning the light on in the entire dungeon. T for teleport. So that's uh, that's the teleport menu. And and since we're going to start the game, you will see that later. So uh, let's skip for the next one. And then I wanted something for the inventory where you would have uh, boost energy, increase stats, add money. Um, we have a set, everybody involved got their own personal weapon. So there is a personal weapon menu. So you will see a Jason space gun there. <laughs> uh, and I didn't have any, any logical character for it. So uh, in honor of Mr. Zed, this is Zed. And here you see 2.1. 2.1. Um, Jason, tell us what we are going to see here. Yeah, we're going to see uh, what was one of the earliest cinematic intros uh, in, uh, in, you know, 8-bit gaming history. Uh, this is actually a reinterpretation of the original video uh, video intro from, from the alternate reality of the city. Um, the notion is, you know, here's, here's a regular everyday cityscape and a, a spaceship descends from out of the sky, beams some people up and, and zooms back off into space. So the premise of the alternate reality games is that you, the player, are on some level aware, well, am I on a spaceship? Because otherwise this looks like kind of a generic, you know, medieval city uh, setting. Mm -hmm. And the, the premise of the whole seven game cycle was supposed to be about, uh, you know, exploring uh, what it means, you know, who these aliens are, what they're doing, you know, how you can either, uh, you know, conquer them or, or you know, take them over. And we, we see a little bit of that in, in the dungeon, uh, but they don't, they don't really finish that part of the story. Uh, but yeah, we, we, it's this uh, animated, uh, you know, there's the soundtrack, there's special effects. Uh, we end up in space. I don't know how long you'll let the intro play, but uh, it's it, it's one of the more memorable, uh, you know, uh, table setting moments in in an RPG that I can think of for me. Yeah, for sure. I, I I truly agree, and it and it tells the story. You are beamed up, and then they the aliens throw you into alternate reality, whatever yeah. that is. So you are actually one like a citizen of this city, and you're beamed up. Okay, so let's. See where we are. Did I... On there you go. And the famous spaceship, the one that you've seen already. No. Super well synced to the music and everything. So this one, and then it flies off. And then there is actually a second intro, a Starfield intro. And I listened to the music yesterday on that one. And uh, having listened to this one, which is very thematic and, and super nice. But the one with the Starfield, I was absolutely sure there was something wrong with it. And then I listened to the original and it sounds a bit, no. I... 
the, the, the ver my version sounds exactly like the original. I'm, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We will not recompose it because we don't like that music. Uh. Oh. Well, I mean, and that was one of the things that, that made the alternate reality games stand out from the pack uh, was their heavy reliance on music and, and music with lyrics. Uh, it, it, mm -hmm. I think for a lot of people, it was their first exposure to karaoke lyrics because it was putting yeah. the, it puts the, the lyrics to the, to the songs on the, on the screen and, uh, yeah, the the dungeon uh, added uh, for the '64 version anyway. The 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 '64 version of the city didn't have uh, music for the intro. Uh, you get it in game, but uh, they did a nice job setting setting the tone and, and giving you a, a sense for what uh, you know what's coming through the through the lyrics. You know who you, who you are and what you're doing. You actually will learn uh, more about as you go into different uh, locations in the game and just pay attention to to what's being sung. Well, I mean, even the Rats Keller, where you can, go, which is the restaurant, there is one restaurant, and, and okay. that's the one. But they have multiple songs, so if you go in three times, you can have three different songs. I, I think there are like three different songs, and there is lyrics to each and every one of them, and it's presented like karaoke. It's yeah. 1985, guys. Okay, we we skip that part, and uh, so this is actual loading time. This is how long it will take. You should really use um, real drive sound when you're using an emulator. It's a, it's an absolutely ridiculous feature, but I really love it. There we are. So let's talk a little bit about this this main menu because this is not yeah. exactly the main menu from the uh, the unaltered original. All right. So new new character. That's sort of obvious what that one does, and I think we that's what we're going to do. But uh, we will have a look at uh, resume, which is also one of the original menu, uh, menus. Uh, P is to prepare a save disk. So you, if you have your your characters, you can move them back and forth to ev every disk you have. Uh, but then the index file will be lost. So this is creating that little index file and. Um, there, I do create it automatically later, but uh, during my, my first steps implementing the save, I didn't implement that save, uh, the, that automatic, automated generation of the index file. So I needed to have like an, a special option for it. And then I decided to keep it because it's really handy for when a character is lost, this one overrides the index file, which means that he's no longer lost. Uh, let's get back to that uh, in a second. Uh, sure. I have removed format disk. Uh, there was an option for formatting a character disk. Here you don't need to format the disk. There is plenty of space on the first disk side. So save on the first disk side or just have any blank disk. That works absolutely fine. And of course the uh, D81 has tons of yeah, and then, yeah, but it's still limited to four slots. So you, right. bear in mind that you will only have four slots. It's not so many characters as you can fit on the disc. It's always the four. Uh, and the other option would be delete characters. You can delete your file. Just, just delete the file and you're good. Uh, you don't really need to do it via the menu inside the game here because that was the only... At the original, that was the only way you can access an individual character. But here they are files, so you can you can access them at, at will, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so the uh, but resume characters, uh, we can have a look here. So now we're loading the uh, well, exploring the uh, the options here. And we see that Svenne uh, and Pontus, I'm also lost. <laughs> so Jason, what is lost? So the, uh, the alternate reality games owe a lot to the you know, rogue and, and roguelikes and the city was very hardcore. Uh, you, when you loaded uh, a game, it basically deleted that game. So if you, if you died, if you turned off the computer in a panic, if you lost power, that, that character was gone. So unless you did what they now call you know, save scumming and, and made a backup and things like that, that character would be gone. The dungeon developers decided that was a little, little heavy handed. So basically, if you once you load a character, 
it, it's put into this this lost state, and basically you can get it back, but you'll take a step. Uh, you'll you'll be put back at the uh, the entrance to the dungeon, and you take a a step penalty uh, when you're brought back. So it's a much friendlier way of of letting you uh, proceed and and you know build a character and, and learn about this game without without uh, the the specter of permadeath or spending a lot of time flipping discs and, and backing up floppies. Right. So you lose a bit and it's it's random what you lose, but typically you lose one of the uh, strength or intelligence. It decreases that with one. And then it you always end up or, or when you resume, you are put back in the original point where you start the game. If you if you descend the first time when you go from the city, there are basically two places where you could go. It, it's the first one, which is the one we will see. That's, I think that's the one uh, where the game naturally starts if you don't have a character that you import from the city. And then there is some other place also where I don't really know where it is, but it places you in this spot that we will see when I start a new character. So if you are way into the dungeon and you are lost, then you will be reverting to the first place where you, which right. you will see here. So, okay, we can get back here. I can press the P button. This is just a bit of text set telling you that uh, what it will do, it will recreate the index. I, I will not worry with that. So we will create a new character and we will name him Jason, of course. Oh, thank you. Do you want to be male or female? I'll stay male, thank you. Yes. Here, there is actually a, a cheat option or, or uh, huh? developer's option. You can, you can type adept dash one Right. And you enter the adept. And this is the place where you choose male or female, right. adept yeah, one. Then. And the only thing that happens is you have a new option. You can press F1 and, and you can watch parts of the memory in it. So it's, it's only for the developers that were game testing it to see parameters in memory, I guess. So That's a right. little they, machine they code monitor. Some, some built-in uh, tools and, and their own trainers yeah. as yeah. well. The, the tactical nuke, which we might see yeah. here. So you became male, and this was correct. That was correct. So now we are at the, the it was the floating gate in the city. Now we're at the, the gate the dungeon where above us, the stats are scrolling. Uh, so this was the way that our, uh, you know, our recently abducted, uh, you know, urban citizen becomes an RPG character. They literally walk through a thing that's showing them what their stats are going to be, which is a, an interesting uh, meta concept. So. Uh, very similar to the city, uh, and we're getting silver instead of copper. The stat, the starting stats are higher uh, than they were in the city. Uh, the game is a little more, uh, it's a little more challenging maybe, but it's also a little more forgiving. Uh, they didn't want to make uh, quite as many Doom characters uh, in the dungeon. And uh, yeah, it rolls and rolls and rolls until we hit space and our, our stats are set and we enter the dungeon. Right. And, and my take is that you are in the spaceship here. So what you yep. see here is the spaceship. And then you see some sort of portal into the alternate reality. Yep. Okay. Ooh, low hit points. Showing. And now we enter the dungeon. A little bit of loading. One disc flip. Yeah. And now you see that this is twice. This would be a very good time for it not to bug, I would say. There we go. There we go. Okay, I'll press pause. Anything okay. you want to say about where we are and what to do? Or do you have any suggestion of what we should do here? I, well, I think uh, let, going to the the, the, the DNP shop around the corner just to, uh, to show that in action. Yeah. Um, yeah, and just for people who are familiar with alternate reality, this, this should look pretty familiar. You notice that we have torches in addition to our, our usual food and water. Like Pontus mentioned, uh, that's because most of the dungeon is dark. And in the early going, the best way to get light is to uh, you equip one of the torches as your secondary weapon. You can use it in combat, but there's a risk to doing that. Uh, they do burn out eventually, and you have to replenish them. Uh, we'll have the the uh, the items and so forth uh, uh so we're going to the uh, we'll, shop. We'll talk about the inventory system a little bit, but yeah, take a left. And in in city, the you need to press uh, press repeatedly, oh, which is yeah. sort of what I got used to. But here, you can actually press and hold. And hold. So you do yeah, a, a little, a little I K J L for for steering. 
which which used to be the standard. I, I got very confused when everybody said, no, it's, it's WASD. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. You can that's actually use the joystick as well. But uh, yeah. um, given that I'm running this uh, in an emulator, it's quite handy to, to do it on the keyboard only. So to, to we can start uh, equipping ourselves here. If you just kind of go through the, the battle gear, it might get people. So stock up. Sure. Uh, so here we can get uh, you know, timepieces. Uh, that's a that's a new concept in the city. You, if you wanted to know what time it was, well, you, you could look up. Uh, the, the dungeon doesn't have the same environmental effects that the city did. The city had weather. It had uh, you know sunrise and sunset. Um, but we, if, if you wanted to know the actual time, you had to go to an inn. Now you can actually carry a timepiece with you, which is actually important to uh, to a, a puzzle. Um, and we can pick up food and water. We can also get those at, uh, at the restaurant, as, as mentioned. Uh, this, is, this is kind of combining the, uh, the smithy and the shop from the city. There are, there are more advanced smithies later in the game, but this uh, Damon and Pythia shop is the, the best place to, to start equipping your character to, to build them up. And, and to be honest, I mean, there were multiple shops in uh, in the city whereas this is the main one and right. there are kind of special shops for potions and uh, one for weapons and all of that but this is the only general one and there is only like one general restaurant and there is only one inn where in the city there were multiple so why don't we why don't we go to the weapons let's just buy buy a stiletto or something like that and uh, oh sorry i exited that's okay I think I know another way to get weapons. And I know <laughs> where they, you can get them cheaper. Well, let's let's go through the F7 menu first. F let's just yeah, yeah, show. Okay. So F7. Uh, yeah. So. So you see the the readout of the the kinds of items you can you can collect. Uh, both of the alternate reality games had a concept of of weight. You can become encumbered by all the stuff that you carry around. There's a lot more. Uh, there's gems, jewels, crystals. Uh, there isn't a bank uh, this time, but the uh, those gems and jewels and crystals have specific uses. They aren't just a thing that turns into money later. Right. Uh, if you cycle through uh, primary and secondary weapons, that's that's carried across. Usually, the secondary is either your torch or your shield. Now we have armor that's a little bit more sophisticated. You've got different pieces of it, so you can kind of mix and match armor as you find it. Cycle ahead. Uh, it was one of the first games that had uh, clothing, and now the clothing means even more. There's actually a character that uh, that admires the way you dress, and, and it has different effects in the world as well. And it has special preference for two particular yep. Yep. items. No active, active magic, magic. which uh, as you as you drink potions and, and stuff like that. Oh, we have an encounter. So this is also a little special. Uh, when we reach an encounter, it will uh, do the screen red. Okay, now this is a nice guy. We just talked to him. We are fully healed, so we don't need to talk to him. But uh, in the city, you needed to go to the healer. Uh, that was a special place. Now Shot. he's roaming yeah. around. So don't yeah. kill this guy. That would be a, a really stupid move. Yeah, and it does keep track of that. Yeah. So he left. So cycled through. The, yeah, there's, there's active magic, known diseases, uh, which the healer would, could have helped us with if we needed. Okay. Oops. Oops. Ooh, okay. this could be a fight. It could be, but uh, sometimes you can wait him out. Yeah, try transact. Let's, let's try to hail him. Mm. And he's not interested in that. Okay, we will have fight here. Maybe. Like you said, we, we could wait him out. If you turn and run, they might steal something from him. Oh, he okay. leaves. And you see we're on level one of the dungeon. Um, basically, this game is bigger than the city. There are four different maps just for level one, and you kind of transition between them. There's a bit of a disc load. And then you, as you go down the dungeon, each of the maps gets smaller and smaller. But it's still, uh, it's still a very big game. Okay, now we're moving into a place where you... Up to the left here, you can you can sleep, and then onwards you have a rat's keller, so where you can buy your food. Yep. Uh, in here, 
I'd like to just display a bit of the depth of the game in this very corner here. We will have an encounter. My guys are here, Pontus. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, there is no issue with the sound so far. So I'll, I'll pause here. So okay. what you see uh, here it. is a doppelganger. So if you are super well equipped, uh, the, the opponent you are uh, facing here is also super well equipped. And also if you are a male, your doppelganger will be male. And if you selected female, your doppelganger will be female. That's one of the, the aspects of the game. Again, this is done on three disk sides, three really old disk sides. So it's, it's a lot of coding behind that. The other part that I would like to mention also kind of highlighting the depth of the game is uh, if you go to the uh, Ratskeller and drink and you drink a lot, you can actually become drunk. Uh, and then there is a parameter of how drunk you are. But <laughs> the way that the game works is that it has sort of a buffer. So when you drink, it ends up in the buffer. Think of it like your belly. And then it takes the, the, the content of the belly and, give, and adds it to how drunk you are. So you can drink a lot and you become just tipsy. And then after a while you become really, really drunk. Uh, so just emptying the drunk parameter will not help you. The trainer I'm going to show you later, in that one you need to actually cancel both of them. Uh, okay, well, let's... So I'll press W here, and, and I have this um, visual effect, some sort of visual feed, feedback. It just flish, flashes the border so that you know that you press something. And our doppelganger is gone. He will be there again if I go there again. So uh, yeah, so we will be leaving that room again. Going back to where we started, um, I will show you the other, one of the other things you can do. Okay, so you see, you will, now you see the edge of the, the door to the shop there. But we are now in a corner and, uh, and I know that on the left here, you do have an opening to the other parts of the dungeon. It's just a hidden door, so you need to know it's there. Or you press Z. So this is parts of the trainer menu. If you want to set your stats really high or hit points or cure any disease or poison or, or what have you not. And if you are drunk or dehydrated or uh, don't have any food and you lost all your energy, uh, this is where you can have that as an in-game option to fix that. And uh, there is also, if you're leaning towards good or evil, uh, you maximize turning to good by pressing five here. Uh, yeah, enrich yourself, collect torch and compass, get keys. There are a number of doors, you need a number of keys. Let's pick up some keys. And then also there is weight associated with everything here. So uh, the more more item you have in your inventory, the heavier you are, the heavier is the stuff that you're carrying around. So this is the option to make the inventory light. So you basically, everything becomes super light and there is no delay. You, know, you, you would walk rather slow if you're carrying a lot of things, but um, by this you make everything light and you walk normal pace again. And here we have the individual <laughs> weapons. They work basically the same. My sword pitcher, who has done a lot of the work here, uh, he has been awarded an ax. Thrasher doing a lot of the intro work. He was awarded a shield. TNG who has done a lot of the documentation and game testing. He has received a trident. And Jason received the futuristic space gun. The golden horn is nobody's in particular, but that's also a useful item. Um, and you will need to learn that by reading the documentation on why you want one of those. Uh, and so these are the, the previous ones were the attack 
items and now you have the armor that cover all parts of your body and you can be hit on different parts of your body because the the armor is not general it's just protecting that particular piece of your body that it will it will protect and then we have a number of magical items that are super handy and here i would like to pick up the supervision the four um, and on the last page here you would have a number of items that is relevant for the overarching quest in the game. So you can go around and just bashing and, and building your character to the best of your ability and exploring it to find where to go and, and uh, do mapping and compare and what have you. But then there is this super quest that you can actually fulfill. And these are items relevant for that quest. And now we're back to the first one. So I press escape again to, no, sorry, return for exiting. Okay. And then uh, the commands here would be use, drop, and get. So get if you're standing on top of something and you want to pick it up. Drop is if you want to offload something you have in your inventory that you don't care about anymore. And use, which is one I'm just going to select here. Uh, so forward and potion of supervision. Okay, you drink supervision and see what happens. Suddenly you see the door there on the left. Let's go in and you can of course go through it even if you don't see it, then you need to just know that it's there. And now we're introducing the last uh, trainer. You see that it's pitch black. I'm pressing X for the master switch to light and hey presto, let there be light. Um, I should mention a few other small things here. Uh, where are we? No, we can press P like that. Pause, pausing the game here. Um, Devour is one of the encounters you can, you can uh, bump into in the later part of the game. That's when your inventory has become really big. Uh, hello and welcome back, Jason. So I, I got back just in my... time to talk about big inventory. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was the inventory trainer. Uh, we do have the teleport trainer still, but uh, and I've shown that I'm now turned on the master switch. So this pitch uh, black part of the dungeon is now fully lit. Okay. Uh, so, well, you can have a, a go on what is the devourer? Yes. So we, we've talked about the differences from the, the city to the dungeon and I've mentioned a little bit that the inventory system is more sophisticated. Uh, if you remember um, when we were doing the city, I had to explain a few different times the way that potions worked. Uh, for example, if, you're, if you play a normal RPG, you think like, well, you get a potion and the, the dungeon master or the game, they know what potion that is. Maybe your character doesn't. Maybe you need to use an identify spell or go to an herbalist or whatever and find out what that potion is. But the, the, the game master, whether it's a person or the computer, knows what that is in the background, right? Well, that's not true in the city. In the city, the only bite that's used to keep track of potions is the count of potion. It's just a, a single bite counter that you know, tells you how many potions you have. When you go into the, I want to drink a potion menu, that has a random generator that creates the potion on the fly and you either drink it or discard it. The dungeon is much more sophisticated than that. So it knows what every item you collect is and it lets you collect each of those individual items in inventory slots. But this is an 8-bit machine. It was actually designed to work on the Atari 8-bit with 48K, so you know, even, even less. So they realized they needed to do something to keep inventory from getting out of control. And some games like the Bard's Tale series or Wasteland just had a fixed number of inventory slots and you, you can't go above that. The game will make you drop something. The dungeon's a little, a little sneakier. When they notice that the memory is starting to get full, they send the devourer after you. And the devourer is there to eat your items. And it's also there to eat items out of the, the game maze because uh, I don't know if you've uh, killed anything and shown, but corpses pile up, things that you don't take pile up 
in the city, if you didn't take an item when you found it on a dead monster, that item was gone forever. If you dropped something, that item was gone forever. In the dungeon, they have persistence, but only up to a certain point. And when they start running out of memory, the devourer comes and starts gobbling up items and, and eliminating them from the game. For anybody coding, uh, the devourer is basically the garbage collect. You need to restructure and then ditch what's not used. So uh, that's what it's doing. It's it's a character doing garbage collect for the uh, the persistence of, of items in, in the game. It's... That was that was one of the, the earlier fun discussions of like you guys need to know about the devourer. What? I'm like I'm telling you. <laughs> well, you I mean, just... when you, when you, when you're cracking a game, you always look for areas of, of memory where you can place your your little things. And and I found this massively big area. Uh, which seemed to be at the end of the block where uh, the inventory was stacking up. So I guess I could have introduced the devourer a bit earlier and, and uh, minimized the options for, <laughs> for, for inventory uh, to keep that memory. But uh, there was other areas of memory that I could use for my purpose. So it now works 100% like the original. Um, uh, so Jason, uh, oh, um, <laughs> There might be a bit of a noise in the background here, but what about the FBI agent? Have you met him? Uh, not for, well, boy, I wonder if I've actually seen him. I think I've seen him in an 8-bit emulator. I don't know if I ever saw him on the 64 because I had the original. Um, but uh, yeah, the you know, it was not uncommon in the 80s uh, to have, uh, have the copy protection reflected in the game somehow uh, in, in Starflight. Uh, there were the cops that would uh, that would pull you over if you couldn't pass the code wheel check. Uh, I know some uh, Sierra games did that. Alternate reality, the city just silently murdered you if it felt that you'd copied the game. Uh, but the dungeon takes a, a little more of, a, of an overt effect and sends the FBI after you if it, if it yep. thinks you're on a pirated copy. And if you think you can kill him, you, you can't. The, the, <laughs> our trainer, the wind trainer, will actually kill him. And oh. I've never met him, met him like naturally because uh, the uh, the disc image disc images I got from you they actually worked perfectly, which means that there was no sense that there was a, a, a breach of the copy protection. So uh, I've never seen him, but I could enforce him to appear, and then uh, he's evil, and you can bash him any with any weapon of any kind. He will not take any hit. Right. Um, there was this. Um, I wanted to to. Uh, yeah. So this is why you don't want fifteen menus because cycling them becomes a bit boring after some time. So tell us about the tactical nuke and ace of cups and high priestess supervision. I've already shown. So okay. Well, the the ace of cups and the high priestess. Those are uh, I guess the official uh, items. Uh, the Ace of Cups is a, is a tarot card, and there's a few of those in the game, uh, that both of the, the, the city and the dungeon would keep track of your morality, for lack of a better term. You could do good acts or evil acts. In, in the city, though, there was no way to, to do good acts that would cancel out your evil acts. You would just accumulate negative points, and eventually you would get kicked out of almost every, uh, every shop, and it, it got to be a problem. Uh, the dungeon is more uh, advanced and, and flexible in that way. So you can earn good points by uh, helping paupers. You can give them money and, and things like that. Um, but there's also a notion of being a member of a guild, which again, in the city, you would just run around and go into guild buildings and basically they'd, they'd give you a stat boost and they could remove curses from your items, but it was pretty, uh, it was pretty simple. In the dungeon, you can become a member of a guild, but they have membership requirements. And sometimes though they're mutually exclusive. Like you can't, you cannot be simultaneously evil enough to be part of the really evil guild and good enough to be part of the, the really good guild. It just doesn't work. Um, and there are, there are guild uh, rivalries for lack of a better term. So the Ace of Cups wipes clean all of your relationships uh, with the guild and, unless you start over. So that was a, a nice little uh, item to have handy in a, in a trainer. Uh, and the, the High Priestess is a, a sort of limited invulnerability uh, since we, you know, we do have the trainers in there for hit points and stats, but if you, you know, just need extra protection that you don't have from the, 
the items you've you found or trained in, uh, then the High Priestess will will help you through some some combats. The Tag okay. Nuke, uh, that's another. That's actually yep. uh, something that the the developers put in, kind of like the Adept One mode. Uh, they had a little uh, a little cheat code that they could put in for themselves and give themselves a a super effective uh, nuke spell that basically would would win almost every fight for them. So this way you can get that in your own spell casting menu uh, if you pull it pull it here off the trainer. So and given that this is an in game trainer, you can choose how much you want to cheat. I mean, you can you can turn them off uh, saying no in the beginning, but. Mm -hmm. You can also only pick the ones that just help you with that particular place, rather than if you don't want to go super cheat and, and just bang yourself and make everything super easy and you still want the challenge, just pick the ones that you want. And uh, if you want to go technical nuke and, and win, yeah, well, I guess that's basically the same as pressing the W in my trainer. So uh, yeah. yeah, both are there if you want them. All right, um, should we talk about this overachieving goal? Yeah, you know, the, the dungeon, uh, it's, it's meant to be a, a part of this seven game cycle, but at the same time, uh, I think the, the designers of it, recognizing that the city was pretty shallow when you get right down to it. Uh, so like we talked about, there is, there is a quest, you don't know, what it is at the outset but you start to you know as you as you get deeper into the dungeon you start seeing more of the the the, the real world uh that you're in and like we said we, you, yeah. you enter the spaceship and you start to see more hints of that as you you get deeper into the dungeon so you start finding items that aren't consistent with the you know kind of sword and sorcery uh medieval uh you know setting that that it looks like it is so there are, uh, you know, there are the puzzles and, and riddles that you, you start to work your way through. And, and eventually when you get to the, uh, one of the control rooms uh, for, for the dungeon and you, you'll, you'll need to have done a lot of homework to be able to survive that encounter, uh, you, you do get, uh, you get a victory song uh, complete with, with victory lyrics. Uh, the promise is to take you to the revelation portion of the game, which sadly, uh, it's it's 2021 and we still don't have it yet, but uh, you know there's always hope. We're still uh, hoping for Arena to come. So, uh... <laughs> well, right, yeah, we we you know uh, we could, or man, Palace, Arena, or Palace, wilderness. or even just unlocking those those areas in the city that nothing's in. The the possibilities are endless, and you've given people a great platform to uh, to build on those on the 64 if they wanted to go back to them, uh, right. but. You you do you have a sense that yes there's there's more to play uh, which sadly we didn't get but just like you know like playing uh, you know, a wizardry game or a bard's tale game where you know the end isn't necessarily the end mm -hmm. uh, you you can get through a session of the dungeon and and feel that sense of like yes I I did the thing I conquered this section of of this world and I'm and I'm ready for more yeah. you'll have to. You'll have to look elsewhere to find that more, but uh, but there is uh, there's there's that moment of triumph uh, that the dungeon gives you, and it's uh, and it, you know it's a it's a really nice feature. Yeah, well, um, I I do agree. To be honest, this is this is absolutely not my type of game. I'm I'm into pinball games and quick games where every session is like three minutes and then you're done. But I'm absolutely fascinated by the depth of this game and and. Uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by anybody who could, without any sort of cheat, complete it. Because this yeah. this quest, I, I couldn't. I, you awesome. know, and I, that's one of one of my secrets is I'm not great at these games. Uh, you know, like I, I enjoy them, but I almost never uh, complete them. Certainly not fairly. Uh, but to in some level, I didn't care. You know, because I I liked the. I uh, like the exploring, the the trying to learn mm. what's going on. I'm terrible at mapping. Uh, fortunately, the the maps are are out there, yeah. uh, and they're a big help in, in exploring and, and getting around. Also, teleport. Uh, the the teleport trainer. I, oh I yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I I should share a screen. I, we did, we missed the teleporter here. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the teleport trainer. Uh, it's uh, it's smart in that it adapts to the the changing. Uh, changing sizes of the of the dungeon you can still end up in a uh in an unimplemented area but the 
the game won't freak out too badly. They actually accounted for that in the testing. There's a there's a special room description that says you are toast and then reminds you what level you're. In. So here, yeah. uh, I should I should say this because there are two ways of describing the coordinates. One, is, first of all, it's hexadecimal, and uh, this is what the game uses internally. So you could find maps uh, giving coordinates with the reference to the top left, and then it's typically hexadecimal, or you can have references to the uh, lower left, and then it's typically decimal. Uh, if you if you pick up the package that this will be in, you will see that there should be a map uh, which is using both coordinate system. One is on on like those edges, and one and the other one would be on those edges. So you should be able to see both. And and so, so in this case, map zero one, the the first four maps are actually four different quadrants of level one. Yeah. And then the the subsequent ones are, are deeper deeper levels of the dungeon. So if you're if you're just playing for the first time and you you know and you change that map level with M and you're confused by seeing that you're still on level one of the dungeon, that's the reason that the first level was so big that they had to to chop it up into four pieces. Yeah. So zero, one, two, and three would be the basically level one, and then you have level two, level three, count, counting from zero, level four, right, and then you're back to that. And then you can also say the direction, so you can f what you're facing. Yeah. So now we, we should teleport to a, a more interesting place. So uh, what do we do? Map like here? Sure. I have no idea where this is. <laughs> Somewhere on. Uh, is it level? It should be level three. Oh, Ooh. very icy. This is where you shouldn't be scratching your arms. In there is a, a description here. In, uh, when you open the the opening here, and uh, it says something about you scratching your arm and you're getting really sick, and you need to go to some healing place before you actually die from it. Okay. Ah yes. Uh, mold. Slime. I just killed the slime. Splatters into nothingness. Uh, sorry for cheating here, and uh, I, I will not spoil all the uh, excitement of winning the games for you. You need to explore that yourself. Yeah, and there is a lot to explore. Yeah, and uh, there was this thing. So this is the, the the general. You can go wherever you want. And and again, do be careful. Read the map and don't teleport yourself into guilds and other rooms. Teleport yourself to the spot outside mm. of the room. Right. and then go into the room. Otherwise, there could be lockups. That's, uh, I could only do so much to prevent stuff like that. And, uh, and I've done what I could to prevent it, but, uh, but uh, it's still possible to mess up if you do it wrong. Okay. And then uh, we have a number of fixed destinations. So the Fairlight Airline here offers destination shop or <laughs> Goblin King or uh, the Oracle. The chapel? Yeah, so if, if you've gone really, really bad and killed paupers for a living, uh, then you might need to go to the chapel and uh, offer a bit of money there, and, mm -hmm. and you will eventually turn less bad than you were before. Right. Is there anywhere in particular you would like to go? Um... Let's see. Point out there is there is a guy uh, in in a group called Active called the Riddler and the Riddler is also part of this. So this is my okay. my humble that... homage to Riddler of Active. I, I think just go back to, to teleport two. Let's just show um, just just go to the retreat because let's just demonstrate what you were saying about oh, not yeah. teleporting inside the shop. So when when we go to one of those, uh, you you don't end up in the room. You're you're immediately outside it. So yeah. you would enter. Yeah. Just move forward. Yeah. And having the game refresh, so uh, you wouldn't need to turn around to have that. Right. The, the proper visuals there was also something that took several weeks. Right. Right, Jason, I think we should wrap up. I'm sure people have other things to do than watch us doing this, even if, if I enjoy it a lot and I could go on for hours and hours. <laughs> well, they should go play this game a bit because, of uh, you know, what, uh, what you and your team have done is you know, come up with two excellently preserved uh, and much uh, easier to enjoy versions of two games that uh, 
you know, they weren't uh, they weren't completely forgotten, but I don't know that they were appreciated by the the, the bigger C64 community as much as they could have been. And uh, having these full uh, Fairlight releases makes them so much easier to play and enjoy in 2021 uh, you know, with, with a lot of the, the features that we would uh, expect and, and like to have without losing the spirit of the original games. So recommend you go play both of them. Thank you. And uh, well, to be honest, I swapped with a number of people during a number of years and, and I bought my 64 basically in 86. So this came out even before I had a 64. But I've never seen this game in the wild before. Uh, so they were they were sort of mythical, uh, said to be impossible to crack, and uh, and hence mm -hmm. they weren't spread. So uh, yeah, eventually you need to take on the big dragons. Some some go around in the woods killing goblins, whereas we tend to go after the dragons. And this is for sure one of the dragons. Yeah. Oh, congratulations. Nice. Super nice. Thank you, Jason. And if you have you. any other suggestion for any other mental projects uh, that we can lose sleep <laughs> over, then feel free to suggest it. Well, I'd like to know what you want to work on, uh, because it seems like I, I've monopolized your time for the past two years. So what's uh, what what are your your unslain dragons? I would I would see uh, I, I would sit down and watch movies for the next few weeks and um, take care of my family and drink wine. And uh, I would probably still be chatting with you guys anyway. I think that could do very well in parallel to do the other things. But I think I will sort of let go of my 64 for a week or two before I do anything else. But uh, feel free to suggest something. And uh, and here, I think I would also say, please send me a personal message with your suggestions because I don't want anybody else to take the hint and steal them in front of us. <laughs> uh, there is one other thing and, and you, I haven't done this so long, so I, I don't know how to do this, but you should press subscribe and the bell button and what have you not. Uh, we don't have any patrons, so uh, we don't do that. But what I can suggest is that you look into a link, which I'm also sure will be down here uh, to Bubble Room, no, Red Bubble, uh, the place where you can buy Mercs. Uh, and we will be releasing uh, a special line of things for this. So there will be uh, uh, the dungeon t-shirt to buy for those who would like to be properly dressed for playing this version. All right. And I'm, Jason, I'm not going to spoil anything, but there might be one coming up in your mail eventually. Oh, cool. And we're looking forward to see you in that t-shirt. Like, I, I will absolutely model it uh, proudly and uh, in as many places as I'm allowed to go. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And Thank very, you. very nice talking to you. And enjoy the game, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.